y'all welcome or welcome back to my channel i'm robin welcome here we're a mess this little guy is also a mess this is blair hi pups okay it's nap time okay okay also joining us today we have the good fellas of nsync you know had to represent for my boys it's just an nsync kind of day but today we're here to do a wrap up. And I know you're thinking, Robin, it's March. Like, what's going on? You're really early for a wrap up. You're right. I don't know what's happening to me right now, but here we are. So I'm going to give you January and February, you know, just to do it all at once instead of like doing January now and then waiting until like May to do February. You know how we do here. So I'm going to give you January and February today. And so, you know, let's Let's get right into these books, shall we? I am gonna go in the order that I read them. So let's just get right into the book. Okay, so the first book I read was Forget Me Not by QB Tyler. And this is about Olivia and Bennett. Olivia, um, they're in, they're, we're married. I think they're in the midst of getting a divorce or they're already divorced. But one day Bennett has a car accident and he is sent to the hospital and Olivia is still his emergency contact person, I think. And she is like, okay, but we're getting divorced. He cheated on me for reasons. None of them are good. And, um, but the thing about it is when he got in his car accident, he lost his memory. So he thinks that they're still married. And this seems fun, like a cute little rom-com and then he's gonna win her back. No, that's not what this is. Um, so Bennett, he's the husband. He is the biggest asshole ever. And um, Olivia, crazy horny all the time, just, you know, we're going to put that out there. You're not reading this book for the plot, guys. You're reading this because you want to see Olivia get her back blown out. I'm just going to be honest. I'm putting it out there. And so both of the characters, like themselves, are just insufferable. Bennett isn't jerk to every single person except for Olivia. And Olivia goes between being indignant and whiny, and it's very annoying. Like, girl, either be mad about it or, like, don't but let's not let's not do what we're doing she'd be like he's such a jerk he did this this and this in our marriage and we should have worked through it and uh but then on the other hand she's like well he blinked and it just set my heart and my lady bits quiver and I'm just like girl what get higher standards I also didn't know like what the basis of their relationship was built on besides physical attraction, which I mean, I guess really you don't need anything in this book. But for me, I needed a little something because maybe if I had something to build on, I would have cared more about them as people. And that's like the outcome of this, but I didn't. So that's how we started off the year. I gave this two and a half stars. So, but that's okay because Ratings get better, I promise. After I went through that shit show of a book, I was buddy reading Thunderhead by Neil Schusterman with Ray. We had read um, Scythe in December and it like made one of my top books of the year. I was very surprised. And then we got to Thunderhead and this is the second in the Ark of a Scythe series. The first book following Citra and Rowan who are two Scythes in training and Scythes are people who in this world kill or glean people because at this point there is nothing in the world that can actually kill people like plane crashes, diseases, all those things are like non-existent because there's this thing called the Thunderhead who is the sentient being and he controls, you know, the things that would normally kill people. In book two, we're still continuing Citra and Rowan, but they have separated, they're gone, they've gone their separate ways and they're on different missions um, for different reasons. I can't say a whole lot because it's the second in the series, but man, let me tell you, I gave this book five stars. I gave the first one, I think four stars or four and a half. I don't remember, but I rated this higher than the first book because I had such a good time with this. We were following the Thunderhead more depth 
more than we did in the first book. And we're still following Citra and Rowan and what's going on with them. But like you throw the Thunderhead into the mix and whoa, insane. First half of the book was a little slow. I'm not, I wasn't sure where we were going with things, but then not even the first half, like maybe the first quarter. And then things start to really ramp up because things get wild and the ending was just brain exploding. I'm actually going to do a video on this in the whole Arc of the Scythe series at a future time and really go into depth about this. And then I listened to Mediocre by E.G. Omalua. This was the book Kamina Reed pick for um, January. And so I listened to this on audiobook. I think I ended up giving this four stars. It was an interesting read for sure. Um, you're really discussing the fragility of the white male ego and how it's quite harmful to everything. Like I said, it was interesting. I had a good time with it. I really enjoyed the chapter on like Bernie Bros, like the pipeline from Bernie Bros to Trump supporter. That I didn't see coming. It was like, how could they just so easily become almost the opposite of what they were originally supporting, but like really they're the same person? Wild. And really what this just boiled down to was white men feeling like they are entitled to riches and privileges just because they are white and male. And then when they don't get those things, they have tantrums. And those tantrums, unfortunately, unlike children, where it's pretty harmless, ends up harming tons of people, hundreds of thousands of millions of people. So that's fun. And then Ray and I had a, another buddy read and we read Jade War by Fonda Lee. I was on the fence about this series and but then we get to Jade War and did I love this? I liked it very very much. I think I ended up giving it like four stars and I think that's because the world really just opened up after Jade City. So this is about the green bones and fictional KCON and green bones are people who have the ability to wield the properties of jade which gives them like super abilities strength and deflection and other stuff you're really following two opposing clans the mountain clan and the no peak clan the no peak clan is run by the call family and you're really like you're into all of the politics. You're into the politics of the No Peak Clan, you're in the politics of the Mountain Clan, but really you're you're in it through the eyes of the Call family. And I will say I enjoy this one more because we got out of KCON and we started doing like international politics and I was here for the shits. There was a character that I really, really enjoyed in the first book that subsequently I did not like anymore like she, mm, she just kept making dumb decisions and i was you're supposed to be the smart one <sighs> it was so frustrating so frustrating but overall i enjoyed this like i said i think i gave it four stars which made me want to continue after that i read year of the witching by alexis henderson i did a whole weekend reading vlog about it that i will link here i ended up giving this three stars this was not exactly what i wanted it to be the I was hoping it would be like creepier. And then once I realized that it was not gonna be creepy, I just wanted it to address some of the issues that it brought up in the book, mostly about like women being these vessels for evil, but how, you know, actually they're not, they're actually great people and they can do fantastic, wonderful things. And we didn't really get all of that. But in this, you're following Emmanuel. So she is looked at an outcast in her town during a time that's like similar to Puritan, Puritan Salem. And that is because she's of mixed race. Her mother was white, her father was black. And so she's like, so the townspeople are like, oh, she's clearly cursed also because her mother was cursed. And then they're like, you throw in these witches that live in the forest and they supposedly did these terrible things to the town eons ago. And so she's trying to combat that history and figure out the power that the witches wield in this, in this town. If you want my full thoughts on it, you can go watch the vlog. The vlog. What is a vlog? 
maybe a new thing. I'll look into it. Following that read, I finished up The Obelisk Gate by N.K. Jemis. This is the second in the Broken Earth trilogy. Um, I finally read the fifth season last year. Last year at some point I was like, oh, I'm gonna finish the entire series last year. Clearly I did not do that because I'm just now getting to The Obelisk Gate in January, but that's fine. Oh my gosh, you know what I just realized? Three of these books are on series that I like wanted to finish this year. Killing it. This, like I said, this is the second in the series. You're following Essen as she makes her way still on a journey to find something or someone and on her way to find this thing or person. She comes across a community of people. She runs into some old folks, some new folks, some maybe forever friends. I don't know, but I gave this 4.75 stars. So this was much slower paced than the first one. The first one, I think, goes a little faster because you're following multiple people, whereas in this one, you're still kind of following multiple people, but not to the same extent as you were in the first book. I enjoy the um, exploration of the relationships in this book, the mother-daughter relationships and the romantic relationships, the friendships that kind of just crept up in this book and alliances that were made. There were people that made appearances that you thought you may have hated and then you start to find out why they are the way that they are. I especially like that because a lot of the people that you get more backstory from, they were in the first book, but they weren't really focuses in the first book. So you kind of were just like, I hate them. And then you get to book two and you're still like, I hate them, but you know why? So I had a very good time with this. I'm excited to get to the last book. I'm hoping to get to that in like April. We'll see, don't quote me on that. It's a loose plan. Then I had an arc of the Hookup Dilemma by Constance Gillum and um, you know, 2022 is the year of self care. And I ended up DNFing that book. I got to 27% in it and I was like, I'm done. So this is about a woman, I don't even remember her name. This is about a woman and she is fighting with this architect company who are coming into her grandmother's neighborhood and have plans to develop it. Basically, they're just gonna toss out all of the residents and build some new housing for rich white people and their families. Gentrification! And so the character is trying to fight this. She's trying to meet with the architect and she can never reach the architect. And then one day she's just having dinner or like drinks at a bar and she runs into this guy and he's very attractive. And they have a one night stand. And then the next day she goes back to the architect's building and you know who the architect is? It's the guy she had a one night stand with. Well, it's it's actually the son of the architect, but so now they're on opposing sides and the architect guy was just like, I don't know what the problem is. Also, he's like very anti-relationship, but for some reason that one night stand was like, oh, I gotta lock this down. And so we all know where this is going. You know, before he, I don't I haven't even finished it and I know it's going to happen. They're going to like talk it out and the architect is probably going to go back to his dad and say we can't tear down this neighborhood there's history and people here and then they're going to fall in love blah 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 there were two things that really just i had to put it down the first was they had a one night stand and then after that the guy was like obsessed not like in a weird creepy stalker way but he was just so into this woman he was like you know she seems upset right now i should be the one comforting her because you know and I'm like, why? Why should you be the one comforting her? You don't even know her. You don't probably don't even know her last name. Like, why do you have all of these feelings and sense of obligation for her? Like, bro, keep it moving. And then the second thing that got me, and it's such a small thing, but by that point I was already over the book. It was just like this one little thing. And, but that was all I needed to be like, no, bye. And that was, there was one scene where there is a gentleman with the woman main character and they end up getting arrested or something. 
And I think it describes him as like a guy in his 40s. I don't remember if they say the age, but it's like a guy in his 40s. And then go forward a few pages and the architect's like, why are those people getting arrested? And the secretary, who was an older white woman, it says so in the book. And she's like, the old, the older black man was talking to the police, something, something, something. I'm like, he's in his 40s. Like, he probably does not look old. So are we just throwing descriptions and what you just said out of the window? Like, I don't understand what's going on. It was so, like, I know it's really dumb. I know it's so small, but like, make it make sense. You wrote, you are the author, you wrote that he was in his 40s. And then you wrote a few pages later that he was an old gentleman. Which one is it? I don't care which one it is, but like, come on, let's have some consistency here. So that, that was that. And then I picked up Slumdog Millionaire by Vega Saroop and uh, again, another DNF. I was really on a roll. This is one of the books that I needed to read before the end of the year. So because I've had it on my shelves for way too long. And so I read it kind of. I think I also got maybe a quarter of the way in and I just realized this is very, it's very similar to the movie. And also, actually, it's, it's very similar. It mirrors it very closely. However, this one is just a little bit worse. After a while, I got tired of child molestation and rape and just terrible, terrible conditions. And I just wasn't in a space to just be like with that. So I had to put this down. I don't think I'll pick it up again just because it's so similarly mirrors the movie that it's like, okay, I, I got it. It's not a story that I think I need to read about after I've watched it. So that was this. You're following this guy. He wins the Indian version of who wants to be a millionaire, billionaire, millionaire. And could you imagine if that was a show? Like who wants to be a billionaire? They were just giving away billions of dollars, whatever. But yeah, so you're following this guy. He ends up winning the show and the show people are like, we actually don't have this money. And he probably cheated. They're trying to figure out like how he knew all of the answers. He's not like college educated. He's not wealthy or like cultured, I guess. And so they're like, well, clearly he cheated. He's a guy from the slum. So how would he know all these things? And then you go back through all of the questions that he's being asked and how he knows them. And they're all like little snippets of his childhood and his upbringing, which are almostly terrible. And the reason he can remember those things is because they're associated with terrible memories. Fun. Then I picked up Pretty Bitches. It is a collection of nonfiction essays by different women and they all take a word that has been used against women. I picked this up because I read Single Ladies by Rebecca Traster and she was a part of this essay collection. She actually wrote, just wrote the introduction, but I still had a very good time. I think I ended up giving this 3.75 stars. That's because in an essay collection, you're not going to enjoy every single essay, especially when they're all written by different authors. You're not going to like vibe with every writer's writing style. So there were some stories or words that really stuck with stuck with me and that I really, really enjoy. One of the very first essays that I really enjoyed was called Ugly. And it's talking about this woman is going through her experience about how she was never called pretty and for a while she was actually called ugly and how it's not her looks that make her ugly, but it is in fact like her actions that make her ugly. When she's not a kind person, that makes her ugly. When she's having an off day and like, instead of, you know, choosing to be kind to someone, she takes that moment to like cut them down, that makes her ugly. So what makes her ugly is when she's not the kind, caring, version of herself that she wants to be. Those are the times that make her ugly. Another essay that I really liked in there was called Nurturing. And this one was like, I hate when people say that women are nurturing. Yes, some women are nurturing, but men can also be nurturing. And we really don't give them the opportunity to be nurturing because we just assume it's a trait for women only. And 
<laughs> she was like, whenever someone says you're so nurturing, she says, I want to tell them to suck a bag of dicks. And she says she says that not because she's angry, but because like it, you, it's not something you would expect from someone that you deem nurturing. Like you wouldn't expect them to tell you to suck a bag of dicks. All, like I said, all of the essays didn't work for me. And I'm just like, some of them I was just like, I don't even know that this needed to be in here. But overall, a good time. And that's all I read for, that's all, that was enough. That's what I read for January. So moving on to February. February, I finished, but I had actually started this in January. That is The Poppy War by Art Kwong. I gave this five stars. I started reading this at the same time I started reading um, The Year of the Witching. So you can see some of my initial thoughts um, in that video as well. I really, really enjoyed this. You're following Rin, she's a war orphan and she is trying to get out of her shitty little town and not become the wife of some old decrepit man. So she passed this test to get into an elite military school where she goes and does all of this military school training. And then when you know it, war pops off. And I thought I wrote better notes for this, but I didn't because the only note I have was don't get attached to anyone. And man, if I would just only listen to my own words because I got attached to people and I was just like, they're gone. And then it hurt. It's okay. I'm okay. So yeah. But Rin, great character. She's dumb as bricks. Don't get me wrong. She is dumb. She does the dumbest things for the dumbest reasons. And I don't actually know that she even learns a lesson from all the dumb stuff that she does. But man, is it great to see her be just full of mistakes. And there's never a moment where it's like, oh, I'm better. No, but she's just a mess the whole time. And her mess leads to some destruction some very bad choices choices were made a lot of them not good it was so fast to get through and i felt like i was just speeding through it i was having more of a good time of, with this than i was with the year of the witching obviously but it just took me a little longer to get through it for just because like i couldn't pick it up as often as I wanted to. I especially like this because Ren starts off as one person, but as she progresses through her time at um, the military school, she finds out she's something completely different. It shifts her identity and what she thinks of herself as. And because of that, I think she's having a heart. I think that's why she makes some of the bad decisions because she's like, well, if I am this person, then wouldn't I do this? And it's like, girl, no, you wouldn't just just think like a regular, a regular person with good decision making skills, which clearly she has none. So that was the poppy war. It was Black History Month. I was in the mood for some black love. So I listened to Once Ghosted, Twice Shy by Alyssa Cole. Why did I get all sultry and smooth jazzy with it? This is weird. Anyway, this is a companion novel in the Reluctant Royals series. You're following Lakotsi. She is the assistant to Prince. What's that man's name? I don't remember, but he's the prince from A Princess in Theory. And but we're not here about him. We're here about Lakotsi. So she was here with her prince in the United States in New York. And the first time she was in New York, she was on a dating app and she matched with this woman and she knew that Lakotsi, they both knew that Lakotsi wasn't going to be around for a very long time. So they weren't going to do anything serious. They were just going to have a good time with each other, right? So they have a good time with each other, but it turns out Lakotsi is going to stay longer. However, Fabiola, that's the name of the woman that she meets on the dating app. Fabiola is like, you know what? Mm, I think I'm done with this. And she goes Lakotsi. Now, one day Lakotsi is on the train and she gets a text like a kind of like, hey, stranger. And it's from Fabiola. And she's just like, now, why is this woman texting me? She ghosted me because Lakotsi had these feelings for her. Okay. And she was just like, mm -hmm. I could, this could be something. 
we could be great. Bakoti was at this point where she had stopped thinking of Fabiola because, you know, she was hurt. She really wanted to see if she could develop something with, um, with Fabiola. And then Fabiola goes in. She was like, I drive myself crazy thinking of you. Shout out to NSYNC there. So they spend a day together and Lakotsi is like, what are we doing? And Fabiola's like, we're just having a good time. And Lakotsi really just wants to get down to the bottom of why she was ghosted. And Fabiola is kind of being standoffish about why she ghosted her. But you have a fun time with the two of them. You can see that they clearly have chemistry and why they would work together, why they would fit together. And it was just so fun to read and I loved them. And like, I would read more about them. It was so good. So then after I read that, I was like, I'm still in the mood for some black love because I had forgotten that I actually have a heart of stone. So, you know, love. So I picked up Sweet Hand by NG Peltier. And this is about Sharice and Kieran. They hate each other. They do not like, when I say they hate each other, I mean they hate each other. And I really enjoy people who hate each other. That sounds weird. Not like real life, fictionally. But um, so Sharice is a baker and Kieran is a music producer. And so they have to work together because her sister and his best friend are getting married. And so they are both respectively the maid of honor and the best man. And so they have to like work together to get things done for the wedding party. Through them working together, they end up falling for each other and like learning about each other and really starting to care for each other. It was very, very cute. The sexy times were sexy. Even like the little third act drama that you already know is gonna pop up. I felt worked very well. People talked. They talked. People were angry for legitimate reasons. Does not always happen. But I, I like that they talked, that they were adults and they talked out the situation. And then there wasn't like a complete just turn around like, yes, I accept everything that's happening. Like, no, it took a little bit of time like it does in real life. So overall, a very good story with some very messy people, some very funny bits. I had a good time with it. And I think I gave this four stars. Oh, well, my camera died. We're back. I decided to pick up I Think I Might Love You by Christina C. Jones. It's the first in the Love Sisters series, um, but I think you can probably read them in any order. It's a novella, so I got through it really quickly, but you're following Jack, uh, Jacqueline, and I don't remember what she does. She runs some kind of business. So it's like, I remember she's in school and she's also trying to like get her business off the ground, but you're also following Caden, who is a vet, and they, don't start off on the right foot, mostly because Jack like really hurts Kaden like physically. They end up having to work together because Jack has to do some community service and so she needs to get it done quick and in a hurry. And so she finds this veterinarian and she's like, well, hey, I'll volunteer here to do my hours. And who's the vet? It's Kaden. So they also hate each other in the beginning for very good reasons. Okay. And then, you know, things happen. It's a novella, so I'm not going to give you too much because it's so short that if I give too much, then it'll just be like, you don't even need to read it. But I want you to read it because it was so good. It was so funny. There were moments when I was like actually laughing out loud. I was walking my dog and listening to it at some point, And I I would just start laughing. And I was so glad that I was wearing a mask because I could just imagine what I would look like laughing walking down the street. So that was, I think I might love you. I highly suggest you pick it up. I, I think I gave this five stars, so. And that's when I was like, you know what? I'm tired of love. So I stopped there. So I moved on to some other things for the month. And that one of those things was Jade Legacy, which I finished buddy reading with Ray. It was a mixed experience for me. It was incredibly slow at points and then rapid fire fast. And so I was never sure. I was like, how long are these intervals? Like, are these days, are these weeks, months? The time jumps was just so off to me and I couldn't get into it. Other than that, 
I really still enjoyed being in the wider world of things, even though we kind of came back to KCON and like the focus kind of shifted back there. We were still, the world was still open, which like I said, was my problem with Jade City was that we were so focused on KCON. But the politics and like not just the clan politics, but like just the overall world politics, the military getting involved. I loved all of it so much. There were still characters that I was just not, I wanted them to be better and they never did. And every time they came around, I was just frustrated. And there's one character who, I mean, I wish death upon. And if you know, you know, I wish nothing but bad things on him from the very first book. Hilo came out to be my MVP. I love that man. And I'm not gonna lie, I shed some thug tears in Jade Legacy. There were a couple of moments where I was like, I didn't see this coming. I'm very verklempt. I'm overwhelmed with feelings. And I didn't expect that to happen only because I didn't really get that way in the other two books. There were definitely moments in the other two books, but man did things just get very emotional for me in Jade Legacy. But I had a good time. I ended up giving this four stars. I think that's what I, you know, the first book I gave like 3.5 and then the last two, four stars. I'm gonna do a more in-depth review of the series with more spoilers and details um, later. But so then I continued on with The Dragon Republic by R.F. Kuang, again, the second, and the Poppy War trilogy. Again, the same thing. Don't get attached to anybody. Even when I didn't get attached, I was being a dumb bitch and I got attached to some people and things happened. <sighs> but Dragon Republic was a roller coaster of a ride. Again, it was another fast read to get through. I can't believe I read both the Poppy War and the Dragon Republic in the same month. That's wild to me. I have, I've never moved this fast through series ever. Rin is in charge, kind of. Is Rin really ever in charge? I don't know. I feel like Rin is just out here being dumb all the time and has no control even though she thinks she has control. I still like her as a character because she is so flawed. I think that's a little endearing in a way. Even though I want to scream at her and shake her and be like, why, why would you do that? Or why didn't you do that? So many times I wanted to say, why didn't you do that? But whatever, there are people in here that I was rooting for and I, you know, it's very weird because I go between rooting for characters and then hoping that they would die. It's a very strange feeling for me. And I'm just, I'm still not sure what I want done with all these characters. I mean, I don't want Rin to die, but some of these other people, they could get it. So, like I said, this is really fast paced. You're going through a lot of battle scenes and they're not, they're very fast action packed. So you're just going and going and going. I feel like there's never really a lot of downtime. You never really have a moment where you can like digest all of what's happening, which it seems very realistic because I'm sure um, Rin doesn't have all of this downtime to digest everything that is going on and happening because once something just pops up, something else is on the horizon and she has to prepare for that. Um, there's never a, a time for her to settle down with any of the loss that she's experienced or gone through. And so she's kind of just battling with that as well as trying to lead a group of people to victory. What victory? It's very questionable. We'll talk about it more later. Then I picked up Red Lip Theology by Candace Marie Benbow. This is a nonfiction this is a nonfiction book. Um, Candace Marie Benbow is a theologian and she talks about kind of her own theological evolution growing up in the black church. It's very, very interesting, um, especially when she talks about where she is now with her faith and where she stands on things. There were a lot of things that I agree with. And I think that as like a millennial Christian that, um, a lot of things resonated with me. They're just things that have historically been talked about in the church that one, we don't really talk about 
And two, when we do talk about it, it's in a almost a harmful nature. She talks about how, you know, being feminist versus womanist um, and what that means for her. She talked about her relationship with like premarital sex, mostly in the way that it stems from her mother was a single mother who was never married to her father and the church kind of shunned her mother. And in shunning her mother, they also would say like terrible things to her. As, even as a child, she came to this point where it was like, I find it hard to believe that God cares more about who I'm in bed with than all the other ills and injustices in the world. And I was like, this is true. She also talks about like the men in the church just being kind of trash, which yes, because men are out here having a whole, preachers are out here being a whole uh, abusers and having all kinds of families on the side and relationships outside of their marriages. But no one talks well now what are y'all doing but people like to often like look the other way but when it comes to things that like women are doing it's like they are terrible people she t i think she went to seminary and she talks about her time there and how she faced um a lot of white evangelicals and what that meant for her and especially um how damaging the ones that were like, I don't see race. And they would always want her to educate them on the black perspective and um, how she would bring these, like the black views to her seminary classes and like the white people in her class would just be so off put. It was a very interesting read. It was also very interesting because each chapter is like a different, she structures it after a different part of her makeup routine. I was here for that. She started off with skincare and I was like, important. I actually listened to this, but I wanted to get the physical copy so I could tab it up. And I plan on doing that. And I had a very, very good time with that. I ended up giving this 3.75 stars and that sounds like it's not great, but it really was. I think there were just moments when I was like, we've gone over this part before in this exact same book. So I don't think we need to reiterate it. I still had a good enough, I had a good enough experience with that I wanted to get it and tab it up. I buddy read with Dasha and Ray, The Toll by Neil Shusterman. This is the conclusion to the Ark of the Scythe series. And I had a good time. Thunderhead I gave five stars and Scythe I gave like four or four and a half stars. In this one, I settled in at about 3.75. It was still a good time, but I think it was much longer than it needed to be. There were moments when, so you're following different timelines and you're following different people, but I think like some of that could have been taken out. I, I like how it all came full circle at the end, but I don't think we needed as much time as we did to get full circle. You know what I mean? I was satisfied with the ending. The plot and the characters were both very compelling and I just, I had a good time overall. I don't know what more to say about this, but I, you know, without giving some spoilers. So that's everything that I read in January and February. I know it was a lot. I'm glad you stuck around till the end. And if you did, I let me know what you guys, what was like your favorite book of either January or February. I want to know down below so that I can have some recommendations and I can go pick up some other books. But I had a good time with my reading over the past two months. I can't believe that I finished two series, that I am close to finishing two more series. Like, I don't know who I am. That's all I have for you guys today. And until next time, bye.